Thanks for coming to the last day first presentation. Uh, my name is Matt Manley, and I'm a GIS data analyst at Critigen. And I'm Bentley Breithaupt, a GIS developer with Critigen. And today, we want to share with you our project that we've been working on, uh, OSM Water, how well are Minnesota's water features mapped? So to start, we wanted to provide a little context on uh, why we're focusing on water features specifically. Um, so basically, like water features, uh, along with other natural features, provide important geographic context in OSM. Um, they're also an important natural resource, so knowing where they are can be an important factor. Um, and they also can act as a barrier or facilita facilitator of human movement. So by that we mean, you know, in OSM you can imagine water features being pretty closely linked to like things like ferry routes or piers or bridges. Um, and finally, they represent a pretty interesting case study concerning the role of bulk imports in OSM. So we'll get back to bulk imports in a second and kind of dive into that, but um, this chart essentially shows OSM feature counts in Minnesota over time. So we're showing uh, highway tags versus waterway tags versus natural equals water tags to show kind of the change in um, feature creation rate over time. And there's two things that are kind of interesting about this. Uh, the first is there's a pretty distinct difference between the relative rates of um, feature creation over time between road features and water features. And the second is kind of how important bulk imports can be to contributing to map completeness. You can see the Tiger import between 2007 and 2008, and the NHD import, which we'll kind of go into a little bit more, but that's between 2009 and 2011. So to kind of get into bulk imports a little bit, um, the OSM wiki defines bulk imports to be the process of uploading external data to OSM. And this acts as a supplement to user-created data. It usually involves a complex merging process, and some pretty popular examples in the US include the Tiger data and Big Maps. You can see how that data makes its way into OSM. So in kind of doing our research, we realized um, that bulk imports have been a pretty controversial topic in OSM for a long time. Um, this is largely due to the nature of bulk imports. They kind of go against the core um, model of OSM, which is that you know individual users manually add verifiable data to the map. There are, however, some pros to using bulk imports. Um, due to the amount of data that you can import, obviously it can increase map completeness. Um, there also can be a validation feedback loop between the external source and the OSM community. And what that means is that if users in OSM make edits to that external data that's been uploaded, um, there can be a feedback loop and that external source could potentially get those edits and make um, some improvements to their own data. There are, however, some cons that people have pointed out. Um, some people think that this might discourage users from making additional edits. If they go to a map and see that it's primarily like looks finished, they may not have like the incentive to you know keep adding to it. It can also be a pretty complicated process. It takes a lot of community input. And if the data source is not super accurate and it gets kind of uploaded carelessly, you could introduce a lot of errors. However, like despite all this back and forth, uh, there's been a lot of bulk imports to OSM, and one of them is the NHD data set which is the National Hydrography data set uh, managed by the US, uh, USGS National Geospatial Program. And essentially what that represents is the water drainage network of the United States. Um, and it was bulk uploaded to OSM in multiple steps um, in the United States, in most of the United States. Um, definitely involved a complex import process to correctly map all these uh, NHD data feature types to the corresponding OSM tags and names were brought in when available as well. So our research questions are essentially, um, we started broadly with what is the state of water data in OSM, and that's a pretty broad question, so we narrowed it down a little bit to specifically what role does NHD play in the representation of water features? And then since we're in Minnesota, we decided to kind of use a case study in Minnesota and look at how it has bulk imported NHD data changed since import. We broke our study into four pieces that we'll be presenting here. Uh, starting off with just how did we define water for this project, followed by where did we get our data from and what did we do to prepare that, then looking at how we identified changes in the NHD data set and classifications of those changes and visualizations to show you. To start off with, 
what, do, what are we calling water here? Uh, we wanted to do something very OSM based, so we literally started with the OSM base map. We just looked at it and was like, what's blue on here? Uh, we found out that that is based on Cardo style sheets that map uh, tags associated with features to the styling that you then see on the map. We went with the water style sheet and selected a number of tags from there to create what we call our inland water definition. This is the definition that we used here. We used four OSM tags, waterway, natural, land use, and wetland, and a variety of values from each of those. We thought that inland water was uh, a good fit for our uh, study in that NHD being a drainage water set, very much fit with that. And then being in Minnesota, not a lot of oceans or seas or anything of that sort, but many, many beautiful lakes and rivers. And we thought that this was also uh, a fairly self-explanatory uh, definition in that it is just anything that is traversing over or surrounded by land. Generally, it is uh, fresh water with some little exceptions like tide flats. After we had our definition of water, we needed to get NHD data out of the OSM data set. We did this by creating what we're calling time slices. These are snapshots in uh, the historical OSM data set uh, at specific points in time. We went with three different time slices, one for 2009 before there were really any water bulk imports, one for 2011 after most of the NHD data had been bulk imported for the first time, and then in 20, a 2019 data set to just use as our current data. We generated these time slices by starting with a full OSM history file in PBF format. We processed all of this data with something called Osmium Tool. It's a, an open source, um, just OSM file manipulation program uh, that works great with history files as opposed to just normal uh, OSM data files. We started by doing a soft clip to Minnesota, meaning just anything that intersects or overlaps with the area of Minnesota. We then extracted those three time slices that I was talking about, 2009, 2011, 2019. And then finally, we filtered each of those time slices so that they only included items that had tags from our water definition. And as well as a few other things just to keep their full geometry, a few extra nodes, that sort of thing. At this stage, we had three PBF files, uh, one for each time slice, each with all of the uh, water data for Minnesota at that time. So we can look at how our time slices compare. So this graph shows our three different years, 2009, 2011, and 2019, showing all features versus NHD features for uh, inland water. You can see that pretty much throughout, um, NHD um, represents a huge portion um, of the data once it's uploaded in 2011, 2019. So there's very little change between 2011 and 2019, which is kind of what we were looking for. We wanted to capture the bulk import between 2009, 2011, and then analyze what's happening between those last two time steps. There's also about 300,000 features that were added, um, mostly sourced from NHD. This second chart is pretty similar, except it breaks things down a little by geometry type, which uh, we kind of took into account in this analysis. Um, this chart's using a logarithmic scale, so just keep that in mind. Um, you really wouldn't be able to see much on 2009 if we didn't do that. Um, but again, it's obvious that there's a huge jump in features between 2009 and 2011. Uh, this kind of illustrates the different uh, proportions of tags per time slice. So 2009, you can barely see, but you can see natural equals water is pretty much like the only tag that's showing up there. Um, but then we have a big jump in the proportions and relative sizes in 2011. And then again, in 2019, there's not much of a difference. Um, one interesting note that's kind of hard to see on here is that there's actually some declines in tags, uh, notably uh, water equals river, water equals river bank, and water equals stream. And we think that's probably due to some changing uh, like tagging practices within the community or some tags that got imported from NHD that maybe should be called something else people decided later on. All right, so up until this point, we've been kind of just looking at counts and things like that, but now we're gonna kind of walk through our analysis of geometric change. 
um, in NHD features from 2011 and 2019. And this will tell us how bulk imported data changes over time with the help of the OSM community. So this complicated chart pretty much just shows our uh, general methodology for this analysis. So we started with our two time slices um, and we compared OSM IDs existing within those two time slices. And if we could match those, it existed in both times, uh, we checked whether the geometry changed. If it did not, we classified it as a no change feature. If it did change, we classify it as a change in geometry. Stepping back a few steps, if the OSM ID did not exist in both years, then we ask whether, um, whether there is a, uh, another OSM ID that essentially replaces it. Um, it's like geometrically intersecting, and we call that a replacement. If there's nothing that's replacing it, we check what um, year that OSM ID exists in. If it only exists in 2011 and not in 2019, then we call it a deletion. If it only exists in 2019, we call it an addition. In order to kind of get at all this, um, we uploaded our PBFs to Postgres and used some PostGIS functions to um, query out the change. Um, basically, we started by querying for change versus no change, and the query on the right uh, illustrates how we found polygonal features that did not change between the two years. You can see it's pretty much doing a join on OSM ID and then using ST equals, a PostGIS function, to um, check whether the geometries were identical. After we identified change versus no change, we broke the change up into our four unique use, use cases of changes in geometry, replacements, additions, and subtractions. All right, so given that methodology, um, this chart shows our classification of polygonal features and how they change between 2011 and 2019. You can see that the vast majority of features uh, stayed the same, um, about 89%, but 11% did change, and that change was comprised of predominantly changes in geometry. So the same graph for just linear features. Um, you can see the proportion of change increased a little bit, so almost 18%. And again, it's made mostly of changes in geometries, but a decent amount of additions as well. We kind of wanted to give you an idea of what like, this change looks like. So this is a map of Minnesota showing um, features that were classified as changing or not changing, uh, just polygonal features. And change is shown in dark blue. No change is shown in gray. Um, one thing to keep in mind is while the north, northern part of the map looks pretty impressive, this is a feature classification. So if these features are giant multi-polygon relations and they're changing just a little bit, they're going to flash blue on the map. So it's not the most exciting thing going on up there, but it does uh, kind of speak to the proportion of change going on within the, within the state. All right, so for the next few slides, we're going to kind of show um, a little time series analysis. So the first image we'll show for each set will be in 2011, um, what the features look like, and then the second will be our 2009 feature or 2019 features, and then the third will show the features that were classified as change for each use case. So we'll start with uh, changes in geometry. So here are our features in 2011. Here are our features in 2019. And finally, this image shows uh, the features that were classified as having changes in geometry. Uh, next, we'll show replacements. Uh, this is our 2011 image, 2019 image, and the features that were classified as replacements. So these are essentially features that are, have new OSM IDs and are geographically very similar to the features that are no longer there. Oops. Uh, so here is uh, deletions. We have our 2011 image, our 2019 image, and there in red is our feature that was deleted. And finally, additions, 2011, 2019, and our uh, additions are shown in green on this slide. So in order to kind of look at this in a slightly more interesting way, we wanted to create um, a bit of a, a slider approach to looking at change. So we created this website. Um, which you can totally visit, and um, that we picked out essentially six use cases that showed different types of change um, between 2011 and 2019. They're just uh, static image sliders, but we used uh, Juxtapose.js for that. 
And this video just kind of walks through um, a few of our use cases that we wanted to point out. So if you go to our landing page, you click through, you get to our six use cases, and then you can kind of play around with looking at how change um, happened between 2011 and 2019. So in this image, you have 2011 on the left and 2019 on the right. We also looked at linear features. So this um, second case here is our linear feature change. And you can see how the, uh, the linear features were realigned with imagery uh, between 2011 and 2019. So to kind of summarize what we found from this analysis, um, we really did realize how big of a role NHD plays in inland water features um, in Minnesota specifically. Um, NHD represents 84% of polygonal data and 98% of linear data. Also, about 15% of uh, NHD features experience some sort of change between 2011 and 2019. So that's that um, changes in geometry, replacements, uh, additions, and deletions. And then 85%, the remaining uh, NHD features remain unchanged between that time period. So with all this, we wanted to kind of like conclude kind of what, what this means. Um, and in terms of the, like the role that bulk imp imports can uh, play, uh, we really, this illustrates like how they can really contribute to map completeness. Um, However, it, it kind of speaks also to like the mindful, careful imports are a good thing. Um, if NHD data was much less accurate, you could imagine there being a lot more edits, a lot more edits that are needed by the community to really bring that up to the OSM standard. Um, but combining these rich data sets like NHD with an active OSM community creates an excellent opportunity to enhance data quality. So if you combine a really already good data set with an OSM community, if there is true change in the landscape, that will be reflected by the OSM community changing things. Um, also, tracking features over time can be complicated due to the nature of the way things get imported and then replaced in some cases or deleted or added. Um, you can't just like track one OSM ID over time and expect to just capture everything. So our future research, we kind of wanted to dig more into this kind of bulk import question. Um, can they affect editing rates? And to do that, we'd have to look at some areas that uh, did not see like an NHD import, but also have kind of a rich data set of water. Um, we'd also like to compare updated NHD data with OSM. There has been like this NHD plus update that um, you know, would definitely have some additions to the data set that probably have not been integrated with OSM. So if we can kind of compare the updated NHD data with current OSM data, that would kind of be an interesting question to look at. Um, also, we really didn't look at tags in this analysis. Um, so a feature could have its tags changed, it could have its geometry ch uh, changed, or it could have both. So there kind of increases the complexity a little bit there. And then finally, uh, building an interactive viewer instead of using these static images would be a great way to kind of explore the data more thoroughly. So we'd like to just acknowledge our team. Uh, without their help, we wouldn't be here. And at this time, if you've got any questions, um, we'll leave you with some ways to stay connected with us and feel free to reach out. Thanks. Any questions, comments? Jokes. So you mentioned um, you know, how looking at your bubble graph of uh, changes that you think there might have been um, tag updates, but you know, your querying wasn't looking at it. I'm not super familiar with kind of the hierarchy of natural water tags, but right. do you think, I, I guess another question might be in the attribute mapping of the source NHD data, what, was everything just natural water or were there other subclasses? I know you showed ditch and, yeah. and some other things, but, um, I guess I'm wondering if part of the cleanup of that import would be to try to improve the classification or NHD had about as detailed a classification of those features as you could get. So I think NHD is like hyper detailed, if anything. Um, it's got like, I don't know how many, but it's, it would seem like almost 100 different feature types. Um, and all of those things like get mapped to 
some set of um, more than just natural equals water. Um, so it is complicated. I think it also changed over time. There's like a version one, version two, version three of like all the tag mapping that happened. And I'm not sure, it was, it's very difficult to tell like what um, tag mapping was used for like what features, if that makes sense. Like it, it's sometimes not clear that like when NHD was imported, like what part of the import was that? What year was it that it actually got imported? If it changed in any way, your, your timestamp's gonna be different, so it's like impossible to tell. So there might not be full documentation on how the attribute mapping occurred? It, it was a little complicated. The wiki's okay. kind of like... Well, so then my follow-up question is, you said it's hyper-detailed. Uh, is it possible that you had to generalize a lot of those features yes. because the tagging conventions just don't, at this point, you know, represent that kind of granularity? Yeah, I think the number of tags that uh, features got mapped to is much fewer than you know, the number of feature types that exist in NHD. So it kind of gets put into smaller or larger buckets, essentially, yeah. Anybody else? Another question. Um, I've been doing a lot of changing of ditches, putting tunnels, culverts under trails, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Does that all show up in, in what you're doing or? So um, if the feature, if the feature's ID stayed the same and its geometry also stayed the same, we would not be showing that as change. However, that's kind of one of those future directions we wanted to go in is exactly that. Um, hmm. So if you were to go in and just you know, edit the tagging of it, we would see that in our change analysis of tags. But unless that feature also experienced some sort of like geometry change well, or ID no, change. In order to put a culvert under a path, you have to probably create two points mm -hmm. yes. and then change the type. So it'd probably show up. And, yeah, yeah. And then water crosses water and should be connected, that mm -hmm. type of thing. Yeah, yeah, we okay. picked that up too. Little, little boundary changes in the Mississippi River would yeah, show up. Yeah, exactly. And, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so thinking about uh, the example that was just raised, if, if maybe a node was, was added, um, sorry, not added, moved, yep. like I don't think, you know, that doesn't trigger a version update in the way, I don't think, that contains that node. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if there might be a challenge in, you know, if someone was just cleaning up the shape of a feature. Um, but again, you were using some post stuff, so that might yeah. not be applicable. Yeah. But in the, yeah. the API data model, I'm wondering how yeah, right. you might detect that. Yeah, I think, you want to speak we, to that? Yeah, we didn't. Because we weren't using change sets as such, instead we were taking full time slices of the data, so exactly as the data was at those points of time, uh, and then, as you said, using PostGIS, it would have been picked up any geometry change that existed, whether it's on a uh, node or the way itself. Yeah. Anybody else? Hi. Oh. Um, so I had a question about whether or not it's possible to like close the loop looking at the current state of the uh, national hydrography uh, data set uh, for any type of corrections that might have come in OSM if those types of corrections could be fed back into that national database or yep. back in the other direction of if that has been updated with things that OSM has missed. Is there any way to keep the uh, uh, something like a, a rolling import or any type of way to have back and forth communication between those data sets? Yeah, uh, I think one thing that we found while we were kind of doing research on NHD itself is that there is like an online markup tool that they have where like users can go and like report inaccuracies. But as far as I know, there's no like true feedback loop between things that get changed in OSM versus, you know, like that getting back in NHD. I might be wrong, but um, it seems like it's kind of outside of the OSM community. Um, but that's a great, like, you know, it's a great resource to have, right? I mean, we're showing just one state and a huge amount of change. And, you know, a lot of that change, as you can see with our sliders, is like important change. So if that's not making its way back to NHD, that's kind of a loss, right? Yeah. Um, goes the other way too, though, right? If NHD is doing a lot of development on their end, obviously a rolling import would be great because then you're getting that refreshed data. But you've got to kind of like do that while maintaining any changes that exist in the OSM data that aren't in NHD. So it's a complicated process, right? <laughs> right, yeah. right. Thank you. Cool. Um, 
Um, just uh, wondering about the determination of replacements. Um, was there like an intersection threshold that you use or anything like that? Or is it, <clears throat> did, I don't, I didn't notice how many there were, if it was yeah. like you could manually inspect them or anything like so that. So replacements are like a pretty difficult thing to find, we found. Yeah. Um, because yes, it is exactly that. It's, uh, you essentially look at OSM IDs that exist in one year versus OS, OSM IDs that exist in the other year. And you look to see if the OSM ID that no longer exists in 2011 was replaced with an OSM ID in 2019 by checking whether it intersects, but not just touches. Because we wanted to find things that weren't just part of the network, but were like exactly like they had to intersect in some way that wasn't just like a, a node connecting okay. to another node. In the so as long as some of the area or part of the line intersects, yes, yeah. that was probably a replacement. Yeah. And that was the extent of it, or did you do any further like manual inspection of anything? We when did it some was manual inspection. Um, I will say that it's probably our most mixed use case. Like there's a lot of weird things going on with um, like the way relations are modeled. Like if a way like has its geometry changed, but also kind of re like gets replaced in a way, it's like, you know, what do you call that, right? Is it a replacement, is it an addition? Like knowing what is <coughs> showing what is kind of difficult. So we kind of attempted to get at it, but um, there's definitely room for improvement in that, in that department for sure. Cool, thanks. Okay. Nobody has any other questions? Uh, thanks for listening.